Now, Paul, we've explored a little bit about, you know, how big of a telescope do you need to go try and potentially spy on you? What are the limitations of it? So, so what are the actual benefits of going to space? Okay, so um, we're talking about the benefits when we're looking out That's for right. astronomers. So in our own skins here. That's right. Now, we can be a little bit biased. It's fine. People often think the benefit of going to space is because you're nearer what you're looking That's at. Right. Now, this is true if you're sending a probe to Mars or Jupiter or something yep. like this. But when you're looking at things we look at, far away galaxies, then being in space is you're, you're far less change. You're right. one part in a billion, billion, billion close. It makes no difference. Uh, so the reason for going into space is not to get closer to what you're looking at. That's right. It's to allow yourself to get a better image somehow. That's right. And this is a great example because, you know, if, if we have our person here, as we've talked about before, the Hubble Space Telescope is 2.4 meters. That's how big the mirror is. Yes. Now the new James Webb is six and a half meters. But we can build mirrors a lot bigger than that on Earth, right, Paul? Absolutely. I mean, the, the biggest uh, current telescopes have got mirrors about 10 meters. That's right. And there's a lot of people working on, for example, the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is going to have a whole bunch of eight meter mirrors scattered over to effectively equal like 22 or 23 meters. That's right. So every one of these is still bigger than the James Webb Space Telescope. So if we can build bigger, that's great, right? Sure. So. And it's not easier to be build, build bigger on Earth. That's right. I mean, space telescopes are wonderful, but they're incredibly expensive because they have to be launched. And if a fuse blows, you can't just go down to the local hardware store and buy another one. That's exactly right. Uh, you can't update the equipment very easily on these things. It is a bit for the Hubble Space Telescope. But nonetheless, something like the James Webb Space Telescope costs right. more than every ground-based telescope on Earth combined by a lot. Exactly. So you, pay, you, you really need to have a good reason to go into space. You're not just going to do it, hey, let's go to space. Uh, it has to be really good because you can do much, much, much cheaper for a given size on the ground. Exactly. And one of those reasons is, as we've explored bits before, is what colors of light you can see. That's right. So we can only look at visible or few infrared wavelengths in the radio from the Earth's surface. Anything else, you have to go into space. But why would you want to go to some other wavelength? Why not just use the wavelengths you can see at? Right. Well, I mean, sometimes there's the benefits of measuring how hot something is. And we really need to get to that ultraviolet colors. And we can't see the ultraviolet because they're ozone blocks. Uh, it's very great to see uh, the infrared because the infrared, especially as we get into the mid-infrared here, can see through those cooler grains of dust where the building blocks of planets and stars are forming from, but we can't see that from the ground. Yeah, they tell you different things. I mean, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope's main focus is looking for the very first stars and galaxies. Exactly. And these first stars and galaxies will be emitting at infrared wavelengths. They will not emit at the visible, they will not emit at the radio. That's right. So you can look as long and as hard as you like at this wavelength and that wavelength, and, and you won't see them. You have to be out around here somewhere, and there's nothing else you can do. Exactly. Likewise, ultraviolet surveys like Galax were launched because they wanted to see the very hot energetic activity of, say, even black holes or young stars. And no matter how much looking or building on Earth, you weren't going to see that. Yeah, it's a bit like trying to use binoculars to listen to a radio station or trying to... Uh... I never thought of that analogy, but you're right. It's, uh, they're different things. Exactly. They are fundamentally different things. And getting above our Earth's atmosphere allows it. So that is one of the big, big reasons why you'd want to put one of these. So, you're, so it's not just about bigger, it's about what you can see. But there's also some other considerations that come into play here. That's right. I mean, even if you've got a really big telescope on the Earth's surface, uh, so in principle, our equation tells us that that should give you really sharp That's image right. quality. Uh, but we've got this atmosphere in the way. Now, I'm glad we have the atmosphere. <laughs> I like the Earth's atmosphere. I am breathing it right now. If it wasn't here, I'd be dead. But the atmosphere has thermals. That's right. And these thermals are basically bubbles of hot and cold air moving over our telescope. Yep. And cold air acts like a converging lens, and hot air acts like a diverging lens, and it bends the light. Exactly. And so it's like a heat haze. Now, we're used to seeing a heat haze low over a road That's in the right. desert with some cowboy striding at the credits of a movie. But even looking straight up from a high mountain at midnight, there is still a heat haze, much too small to see with the human eye. But it's what makes stars twinkle. Exactly. And that blurs our images. And even on the best sites on Earth, that blurring is usually much worse than the diffraction limit. That's right. And so, you know, this is a great example. And this was taken from the ground of a small telescope, but looking at a great planet, Jupiter. Same camera, just a few days later. And the only difference here is the atmosphere. Yes, yeah, so maybe a cold front went through and the atmosphere got a bit blurrier. Um, there, now, at best, from the Earth's surface, um, your limit's usually at visible wavelengths. 
um, maybe 10 times worse than the diffraction limit. Yeah. Uh, if the weather's bad, it can be 100 times worse than the diffraction <laughs> limit. And I've definitely had those nights as well. Um, and we always used to count how many thermals there were off the mountain. <laughs> I know that uh, the Australian observatories would count the wedge-tailed eagles circling around because if there are lots of thermals, there'll be lots of eagles, therefore it's going to be a really bad night because the thermals are going to blur That's our right. images. Uh, I know at the observatories in Chile we'd use condors. We'd exactly. Say, this is like a three-condor night. Yeah. <laughs> The international astronomical measurement of uh, bird flying. So s the quality of the atmosphere or the lack thereof in space is another added benefit of going to see it because we can get closer to that diffraction limit. So what we build gets closer, pretty close actually, to that physical limit. But there's still even problems associated with that when you build a telescope. Yes, and another thing is the detector. I mean, your yep. telescope is basically a bucket that's collecting the light and it lands on a detector. 100 years ago, that would have been someone's eyeball at the yep. bottom of it. Um, that was then replaced by photographic plates. Yep. Uh, and now it's typically charge coupled devices at visible wavelengths and exotic devices yes, made exactly. of strange semiconductors out at infrared wavelengths. And so the great benefit of on Earth is, again, because you can fix it, you can build it, you don't have to launch it. You can make some really, 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 really big charge coupled detectors or digital cameras. Uh, and this is one upcoming from the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile, where uh, this is the full moon to scale. So now imagine taking this image and putting moons all over around it. Now, this is on the ground, though. Yes. Now, in principle, you could build very big detectors and launch them into space. Um, this hasn't been done so much yet because the detector technology to build these big ones has been advancing really fast in the last few years. That's right. And a space mission tends to, like the Hubble Space Telescope, the design was frozen a long time ago and it can't be updated very easily. Exactly. Um, but also these things require a lot of power. Yep. They're very heavy. These are all things that make them work well on Earth and not so well in space. Exactly. So even something like the Vera Rubin observatories, where if you were to look down from space as a simulated image, they think that they could pick out a golf ball amongst this great you know, city in Southern California with all those moons, you get this issue of it just becomes almost physically impractical nowadays to put that big of a camera on. It doesn't mean that you couldn't, can't build a good quality camera, but you're not going to be able to see a gigantic area from space. And even if you could, you probably couldn't download the data to Earth. Exactly. These really big cameras are generating you many terabytes of data a night. And there's just not enough download capacity to transmit that much data down. Whereas on Earth, you can put a nice big fiber optic cable to your observatory. That's right. I mean, to put this in a scale, the Vera Rubin Observatory produces an image of 3.2 billion pixels for every single image. You just can't download that from space. So that's, a, again, a limiting factor when you build your satellite. Now, there's also another consideration that people don't think about is the satellites actually themselves have to stay in orbit. Now, not only are they just moving around or stationary, uh, depending on if they're geosynchronous, but they're physically tumbling and moving in three axes, right? It's no good of just keeping pointed this way when you need to point this way or this way. Yeah, and in fact, in the early days, people thought that uh, this is going to be a real problem for space observatories. That's right. That a space observatory, I mean, an Earth observatory, the re way you point something is you bolt it to the Earth. That's right. And the Earth is so big that it doesn't vibrate very much. I mean, we do have earthquakes. I was once observing in Chile when an earthquake came through, all my images were blurred. <laughs> but normally, the Earth is pretty solid and pretty stable. That's right. And um, if you build nice, big, heavy gears to stop the telescope from vibrating, you can very precisely point somewhere. That's right. Uh, and so early, early on, they thought maybe we couldn't do this in space, something that's just floating in the middle of space it's not going to be at a point stably enough at anything. And they were thinking originally of putting things like on the back of the moon. So the moon's not as big as the Earth, but it's still pretty large and heavy. Yep. Uh, but in fact, the technology, when, when it uh, became clear we weren't going to have moon observatories anytime soon, people worked on the technology That's to right. have something just floating freely in space and point precisely at a particular location. And they got very good at it. Exactly. Most of these telescopes have guide star detectors. So you'd look at your target and find That's a star right. near it and, and have a little camera that points at that guide star with the auto servant, every time the guide star wanders off a bit, you push it back again using gyroscopes to adjust it. Exactly. And so in fact, nowadays, I'd say space telescopes are often more stable than ground-based telescopes and how accurately they can point. Exactly. You know, and if, if we look here, this is in the scale of meters. So really, this is a couple of centimeters in terms of the three different directions you can point in space. And you're really getting centimeter accuracy precision in terms of being pretty stable. So that's really, really good. But that also means that our diffraction limit is just now ever so slightly worse because we can't physically make it 
perfectly stable. So we've gotten really good. Oscilloscopes going like this because of you various changes, bits of equipment moving in it, the, um, that's going to blow your image. They're going to burn. like camera shake if you're trying to hold your <laughs> that, That's exactly phone. right. And there's, you know, a, a lot of research is going into trying to improve or limit this, but it's never going to be zero, which means you're always going to be a little bit worse than your diffraction limit. I would say this is a benefit of space telescopes, that not maybe the ones in low Earth orbit, but where they're plunging in and out of the Earth's yep. shadow and heating up and cooling down. But on Earth, your telescope has to fight off gravity, has to fight varying weather, yep. has wind gusts. Earthquakes. In, sp <laughs> in space, you can be very stable. Yes. The temperature can be just the same for large periods of time. You can have a, a very few moving pieces, so there's not much vibration. And so, in fact, often the space telescopes are much more reproducible and stable. That's right. Not perfectly. But, uh, but not bad. Now, one last consideration we also have to think about is even if we have our satellite looking over the Earth, there's no point of building it such that it can only orbit a narrow strip. As you mentioned before, as these are going around, you're unlikely to be able to pass over that exact same spot every time. So what you really need is enough what we call field of view or swath, as it's called in Earth observation, to be able to see a big enough area so that you don't have to physically steer the telescope, you can just point and shoot by orbiting, but still get that required resolution that you want of whatever the telescope is to see the requirements. And so, you know, this can see at over 290 kilometers. Now, that may be good, but maybe you actually realize that your satellite needs to do 500 kilometers wide, and there's very good reasons for that as well. And so by building in the, the range the telescope can see will affect of, well, what is going to be your upper Re limit resolution, what are the wavelengths you're going to see, and all those sorts of things. So there's lots of considerations that we have to think about when we just put a telescope in space. We don't just say, I have some money, why don't we put it up? There's actually a lot of planning and designing, and as you said, you often lock in the requirements and the ideas really early on and have to work to that to launch.